Conceptuality and Social Practice by Werner Bonefeld. Introduction. The concerns of this chapter can best be summarized by the following quotation from Adorno's 1941 publication, Spengler Today. Quote, they, the adherents of dialectical materialism, did not challenge the ideas of humanity, liberty, justice as such, but merely deny the claim of our society to represent the realization of these ideas. Though they treated the ideologies as illusions, they still found them illusions of truth itself. This lent a conciliatory splendor, if not to the existent, at least to its, quote, objective tendencies, end quote. Ideologies were unmasked as apologetic concealments and were rarely conceived as powerful instruments functioning in order to change liberal competitive society into a system of immediate oppression. Above all, the leftist critics failed to notice that the, quote, ideas, end quote, themselves in their abstract form are not merely images of the truth that will later materialize, but they are ailing themselves afflicted with the same injustice under which they are conceived and bound up with the world against which they are set, end quote. In this passage, Adorno praises Georg Lukács as the dialectician who asked how society could be changed by those who are society's victims. Adorno's endorsement is surprising. Lukács' Leninist conception of the vanguard party as the locus of revolutionary practice was anathema, to Adorno. For Adorno, Lukács was important because of his theory of reification. According to Adorno, quote, the metamorphosis of labor power into a commodity has permeated men through and through and objectified each of their impulses as formally commensurable variations of the exchange relations, end quote. Adorno. Social reproduction, Adorno argued, is possible only on the condition that the living have been replaced by the dead. That is, every social activity is always already what Marx called the activity of personifications of economic categories. He seems to suggest that the reified world allows only reified activity, although it was, quote, time for a praxis that fights barbarism, end quote. Quote, whatever one does... It is false, end quote, end quote, everything is the same, end quote. In the context of war and terror, dispossession, violence, environmental destruction, and desperate class struggles to make ends meet, discussions of Adorno's conception of praxis might appear quaint. Here we have modern forms of barbarism, and there we have the theoretician who denounced 1968, end quote, as pseudopraxis. Adorno's negative dialectics is important. It challenges us to think that it, what it means to say, quote, no, end quote. To say no to something is simple, but to say what the no is is difficult. For one, the no is not external to, but operates within the same society which that no opposes. Like Marx's summons of class struggle as the motor of history, the no belongs to the negative world. The no is the negative world's dynamic force. Furthermore, to say that what the no is com compromises the no insofar as it becomes positive, it, positive in its affirmative yes to something that has no valid content except the negative totality of bourgeois society itself. The no is imminent to capitalist society. The no belongs to capitalist society and gives capitalist society its dynamic. As pointed out by Hans Jürgen Kral, conceptuality, begrifflichkeit, is one of the most important elements of Adorno's negative dialectics. In fact, it is the key. What is the concept of the concept, begriff, and what is the conceptuality of praxis in the capitalist social relations? Regarding the critique of reification, reified social relations entail the, quote, reification of consciousness, end quote, 
and what therefore is the basis for a critique of reification and how does one protest against and indeed overcome the reified social relations, end quote. Oh no, there's no quote, that's a footnote. I'm going to reread that. Regarding the critique of reification, reified social relations entail the, quote, reification of consciousness, end quote, and what, therefore, is the basis for a critique of reification, and how does one protest against and indeed overcome the reified social relations? Chris Arthur rightly commends Adorno for having understood that capitalism has a specific conceptuality and that its conceptuality, quote, holds sway in reality, Zaha itself, end quote. Conceptual thinking, quote, aims at the thing itself, end quote. Conceptual thinking amounts to theoretical, quote, digging, end quote, into things and thinking out of things to determine what is active in things and what therefore imbues things with an independent will that asserts itself behind the backs of the acting individuals. Negative dialectics is meant, quote, to strip the blindfold from our eyes, end quote. Negative dialectics is to, quote, extinguish the autarky of the concept, end quote, which makes the thing, the quote, things in being, end quote, seem to exist if by, as if by their own nature and volition. Reification is real, yet what is reified and what appears in reification. Quote, the concept is a concept even when dealing with things in being does not change the fact that on its part it is entwined with a non-conceptual whole, end quote. Reified social objectivity does not exist regardless of the social relations. Rather, social objectivity is the objectivity of historically specific social relations. The, quote, objective conceptuality, end quote, of the capitalist institutions and forces appear as natural and inevitable because of the, quote, prevailing relations of production, end quote. The chapter expounds Adorno's, quote, concept of the concept, end quote, in broad terms. The aim is not to regurgitate Adorno's argument, but to map it out as an exploration of Marx's critique of commodity fetishism and to appreciate its subversive cunning in the eye of the storm. The argument returns to the difficulty of saying no without affirmation of the existing relations in section 4 and in the conclusion. Section 1. Adorno's critical theory holds that, quote, concepts are moments of the reality that requires their formation. All concepts refer to non-conceptualities, end quote. For a critical social theory, therefore, conceptualization does not mean the expounding of meta-theories, which by means of infinite regress finish up akin to the doctrine of the invisible hand with deist conceptions of social existence. Whether in their religious or secularized form, the so-called logic of things. Instead, it grounds the existence of invisible and ontological principles in the historically specific human social relations and argues that it is these that produce their own enslavement to the invisible whether in its religious or secularized forms. Conceptuality does not entail the explanation of one thing by reference to another. Such thought moves from one thing to another in an attempt to render its term coherent by means of external reference. The state is explained by reference to the economic and the economic by reference to the state. By means of vicious circularity, then, explanation becomes tautological. Further, conceptuality does not mean the positing of natural laws, like, for example, the natural propensity of man to barter, as Adam Smith alleged. That man has to eat says nothing about her mode of subsistence and the social necessities that a mode of subsistence entails, so-called social laws. To conceptualize means to bring the thing to its concept. Die Sache auf den Begriff bringen, der Begriff der Sache. 
Conceptuality has to do with the recognition of reality, not with the analysis of concepts. Concepts are required to render reality intelligible, to grasp and comprehend the reified relations, and to understand the power of compulsion that issues from them. Conceptuality goes beyond the immediate perception of reality in order to comprehend what is hidden in its immediacy or immediate appearance. What is appearance and appearance of, and what ha appears in appearance? Quote, why has this content, human social relations, assumed that particular form, the form of capital? End quote. This also means that thought's critical quality does not rest on the answer thought gives, but on the questions thought asks. The comprehension of the social things is not the same as their definition, qua identification, or indeed, quote, registration in a system governed by, for example, ideal types, end quote. The conceptual comprehension of a thing means to perceive a thing's individual moment in its connection, not with other things, but in and through things. Other things. Thinking by means of definition or identification is quite able to say what something comes under, what it illustrates, exemplifies, or represents. Thinking by means of definition or identification does not, however, say what something is. Thinking as Adorno saw it is essentially the negation of things in their immediacy. Immediacy feeds the perceptions and points of view of scientific prejudice, which holds that there is nothing more to see here since the facts speak for themselves. In contrast, conceptualization means to dissolve the immediate appearance of things to recognize things mediated immediacy. Fair Mittelte unmittelbarkeit. Conceptualization melts what appeared at first hard and solid, factual and real, like a certain economic quantity that can be expressed with mathematical accuracy in relationship to all other economic quantities without once asking what it quantifies. Its first impulse is not to ask, quote, what things represent on the market, end quote, but, quote, what these things actually mean for people, end quote. Every act of conceptualization implies it's this initial effort of asking about the meaning of things for people. Their validity is a social validity. Money does not mind whether it deflates or inflates. People do, and they do so because it means something for them in their daily struggle to make either ends meet or conquer the world of wealth to avoid bankruptcy. Conceptualization is an act of revolt against immediacy. Conceptualization does not bow to things. Conceptualization is not social statistics, nor is conceptualization a formal method of analysis. Conceptualization wants to know what the things are, and what they are is within them. Conceptualization does, thus does not pretend that the immediate appearance of things is unreal, nor does conceptualization simply negate the world of appearances as if it were no more than a veil that hides the supposedly real human beings who are drawn into the system at ever greater cost of alienation and suppression of existential impulses. Such arguments as can be found, for example, in Yegi, or Yagi, I'm not sure how you pronounce that person's name. I know who he's talking about, though, because I'm smart and a genius and amazing. And in Marcuse too, are a mere gesture of social critique that in a different context, Adorno rightly dismisses as, quote, abstract negativity, end quote. The critique of reification is critique of the social relations that objectify themselves in and thus assume the form of a relationship between things. Conceptuality is about the recognition of the, quote, existent, end quote, for what it is, quote, the human being itself in its social relations, end quote. However perverted their objectification in the form of reified things. Reification does not make them less, quote, human, end quote, as if the reified world were a world apart. 
reification is not something objectively, quote, given, end quote. Nor is reification found on, founded on some nature, like Smith's natural propensity to truck and barter. Reification is an historically generated social product, and its nature is a social nature. However reify the world of things, and however hostile the world of things manifestation, especially towards the propertyless, mere human material enlisted to produce surplus value and discharged into unemployment without further ado, it remains a human world. The immediacy of things is thus real as objective illusion. Gegenständlicher Schein Conceptualization is required to decipher this illusion, demystifying this illusion through the comprehension of the human social practice that validates and imbues social objectivity with an independent will to the point of destruction. Conceptualization does thus not mean, quote, thinking, end quote, about things. Rather, conceptualization means thinking out of things. If it were really about things, then conceptualization would be external to its subject matter. Thought would thus relate to its world as a tool that can be applied to society like a Cartesian instrument. The social world is here presupposed as something external to thought and vice versa, as if they really belong to different worlds. For example, instead of the critical notion that, quote, concepts are moments of the reality that requires their formation, end quote, concepts are treated as generally applicable scientific instruments which are capable of dissecting and analyzing every society at all times and places, as an historically specific, overdetermined manifestation of universal abstract social laws. This view suggests a radical separation between thought and reality. Haug articulates this view most clearly when he proclaims that the mastery of Marx was, quote, the discovery of thought independent from empirical conditions, end quote. Alex Kalinikos argues similarly. Kalinikos advocates that the Marxist method of analysis amounts to a sophisticated version of the science of knowledge which hypothesizes society as an, quote, as if, end quote, of theoretical construction. Theoretical knowledge appears as a hypothetical figure of speech. And a quote, as if, end quote, which is corroborated by empirical analysis that falsifies or verifies the proposed theory of society. This approach how is, however, deceitful in that the real world is mirrored in its theoretical hypothesis. That is, the science of knowledge posits the scientific idea that the real world is, say, regulated by a competitive market structure and then applies this idea to capitalist markets with conclusive effect, though questions remain as to whether the freedom of competition has in reality not transmorphed into a freedom of monopolies. Similarly, similarly, the sociology of knowledge does not touch reality by thought either. It argues that consciousness is the product of reality, and from this it concludes that reality is experienced differently from the competing class perspectives. From the standpoint of the laborer, capitalism is experienced quite differently than from the standpoint of the capitalist. Capitalism simply means different things to different people. According to Georg Lukács, the standpoint of labor is allegedly privileged because of the standpoint of labor's of the standpoint of labor's ontological privilege as the revolutionary class. According to Lukács, the standpoint of labor is allegedly privileged because labor's because of labor's ontological privilege as the revolutionary class. In contemporary Marxism, the relativism of sociology of knowledge is turned into a positive theory of retaliation oh, relationalism, according to which the social 
institutions like the state are essentially determined by the character of the wider social relations in which it is situated, especially the balance of social forces. The concrete materiality of social institutions manifests thus the shifts and changes in the balance of the social forces that act upon them. Within this analytical frame, quote, the power of the state is the power of the forces acting in and through the state, end quote. The dialectics of structure and agency gives dialectics a bad name. It depends on dogmatic immediacies and moves in vicious circles as it hops from structure to agency and back again from agency to structure, and instead of comprehending what they are, each is presupposed in a tautological movement of thought, none is explained. Thought that does not go into its object does not recognize its object. Such thought is able to name and analyze things in the immediacy of the given social situation, but it does not grasp them, nor does it comprehend the logic that holds sway in them. Relativism does not recognize the power of society in the form of the economic object. Relativism merely pacifies its contradictions. contradictions. Thinking out of things aims at discovering what is active in things. For instance, quote, price of labor does, for instance, does, quote, price of labor amount to a yellow logarithm, end quote. Or is 10 pounds an hour just and fair, end quote. Whatever the fairness or unfairness of a 10 pound an hour wage, analytical thinking does not bring the thing to its concept. It presupposes its veracity, and dismayed by the meager income level of the poor demands higher wages. Why has social labor acquired the form of a commodity? And what laws of necessity exist in a society whose social labor power is a saleable property? What is its value? Are the interests of the sellers and buyers of labor power the same? And how and with what consequence do they converge in the form of a labor contract? And who sets down and enforces the rules of the game of a trade in labor power? Once it has been traded, what has been acquired? What, anyway, is the purpose of the acquisition? And how is labor power consumed? And what has been relinquished and why? And what happens to its seller once it bu its buyer starts consuming the acquired commodity to achieve his own purposes? And is the seller not dependent for her own subsistence on the profitability of her labor, enriching her labor's buyer as the condition of the sustained employment of society's dispossessed surplus value producers? If labor power is not traded, what can be traded instead to make a living? How much for a kidney? How many for prostitution? Reification entails human suffering as the vanished premise of its concept, that is, reification, which for Lukash was the one category of inquiry, is really just a, quote, epiphenomenon, end quote. What is reified? What is reification a reification of? And what is active within reification? And how is it that it has a consciousness and a will? The labor market trade in exploitable human material entails suffering as the premise of the concept of the freedom of contract. The law of value presupposes the force of value which is experienced as an economic compulsion. Marx's critique of religion argues that God requires no explanation. This is not because God cannot be explained and on the basis of power and fear, but because the explanation of God rests on the comprehension of the social relation that, relations that bring God to the fore as an objective abstraction that controls and cows those same social relations from which it springs. Equally, the comprehension of reified things rests on the understanding of the social relations that exist in the mood of the reified object, and that thus disappear in reification only to reappear in it as agents of their own reified existence and its compelling force. Humanity is not a category of economic activity. It is, however, governed by its cold conceptuality, which is fed by, quote, active humanity, end quote. 
For example, money as the form of value represents, quote, the socially valid character of wealth, end quote. Yet it does not recognize hardship, nor does it know mercy and the human need for housing, welfare, education, affection, and human dignity, nor does it know anything about the struggle to make ends meet. However, the money form of wealth does not create the coldness of capitalist society. Money, the money form of wealth, represents the coldness of capitalist society, and, as such, it presents it to the social individuals, requiring the social individuals to generate money for the sake of more money in order to sustain the strength of their link to the, quote, world of social wealth, end quote. It is a truly abstract power. Man, mensch, does not eat money. However, without money, she does not eat. Profit is primary. For the sake of making a living, money needs to be made. That is, it has to, quote, yield living offspring, end quote, for the sake of expanded social reproduction and all in the pain of ruin. The reducio ad hominem that for Adorno characterizes the critical intent of Marx's work does not entail the replacement of the object by the subject. It means the comprehension of the object as social mode of the subject. Just as the idea of objectivity without the subject is a nonsense, subjectivity without the object is nothing. In order to understand society in the form of a relationship between things, one has to be within things. Hegel's notion of the work of the concept, die Arbeit des Begriffs, entails an internal connection between concept and thing, experience and substance, work, endeavor, and the logic of things. The concept, of course, does not work. We do. The work of the concept thus means to be led by thought without fear of where thought might take us. The work of the concept means recognizing the interior life of the economic object, to engage in its contradictions, and to comprehend the sheer unrest of life as the vanished premise of its conceptuality, and thus to understand not only the necessity of its movement, but also its capacity for violence and for inflicting social misery. What belongs to the constituted conceptuality of, say, the form of the state? What is it capable of? What lies within its concept? What is the logic of the matter? Revealing the conceptuality of the social things entails understanding the necessity of the social things mode of motion. Bewegungsweise. Force and power. Macht. Means and ends not as arbitrary coincidences that come about because of the social forces that act through the state, but as definite forms of life that belong to definite social relations. Conceptualization thus means articulating what is active in things, deciphering their social constitution, and comprehending the formative violence, that is, the violence of the original, primitive, ursprüngliche, act of dispossession as the hidden secret of the civilized appearance of, say, the labor market, as the institution of trade between, quote, money bags, and quote, marks, and dispossessed producers of surplus value. This, however, also means that conceptualization, the work of the concept, works against its own tendency. Its critical intent is to demystify the fetish character of the economic object, However, to conceptualize means to identify. Identification does not crush the fetish. Identification affirms the fetish. Conceptualization is thus itself contradictory. Conceptualization has to think against itself in order to bring the thing to its concept. Sache auf den Begriff bringen. It has to articulate more than the logic of society as objectified thing, and this, quote, more, end quote, has also to be within the thing, as its, quote, non-conceptual, end quote, secret, Adorno, or its, quote, secret history, end quote, Marx. The conceptualization of social things entails the recognition of the non-conceptual uh, as their constitutive premise. 
There is, say, no price mechanism without the social relations that carry the price tag on their forehead, and there and there's no law of value without the force of law making and preserve making excuse me there's no price mechanism without the social relations that carry the price tag on their forehead and there is no law of value without the force of law making and law preserving violence the law of value contains the historical creation of the doubly free labor in the law of values concept Section 2. Quote, All social life is essentially practical. End quote. This from Marx's eighth the Feuerbach the This from Marx's eighth Feuerbach thesis includes thinking. Thinking is part of social life, and all social life is essentially practical. The thesis continues, quote, All mysteries which lead theory to mysticism find their rational explanation in human practice and in the comprehension of this practice, end quote. The thesis is clear and at the same time most difficult. Thought is able to demystify reality, and demystification depends on the comprehension of human practice. Human practice is thus deemed essential, and thought's purpose is a subversive one. It is to reveal the hidden secret of all mysteries in human social practice. For thought to be thought, it has to demystify the economic forces as the forces of definite forms of human social practice. And here the difficulties start. What human practice has Marx in mind? How can it be revealed, and where might it be found? The appearance of human practice in the world as we know it, it does not show directly the human practice whose comprehension alone is said to explain the relations between things. If it were, there would be no need for demystification as essence and appearance would coincide. Marx's thesis suggests that human practice needs to be discovered by thought in order to comprehend its mysterious appearance in forms that deny it. What sort of human practice do we have to comprehend for demystification to occur in a valid sense? Can its validity be tested by means of verification or falsification, or is a different, quote, test, end quote, required? Is it valid on the condition that it is true in practice? What does it mean to say that something is true in practice? And this in a society where the, quote, living have been replaced by the dead, end quote, and where the, quote, denial of all will to live, end quote, is the condition of social existence. Marx's thesis that the understanding of all mysteries depends on the comprehension of human social practice implies that this practice is constitutive. However, this formulation is full of dangers, too. It presupposes a definite resolution to the stated problem. If social practice is constitutive, can it remain innocent in the mysterious world that it has created? Negri says that capital is a, quote, bewitching force, end quote, whose power is such that the constitutive subject is, as it were, sucked into capital. In this argument, the constitutive subject is merely an alleged subject. The real power, it seems, is not the constitutive, but the constituted subject. Concepts do indeed live a dangerous life, as de Boer puts it. Quote, in a world which really is topsy-turvy, the true is a moment of the false, end quote. True appears thus to exist in the mode of being denied, an existing untruth that is, however, all true, that is, however, true all the same. That is, however reified the social world in the form of the economic object of capital, of the automatic social subject, where would be, there would be, quote, nothing without individuals and their spontaneities, end quote. The reified world is a world of reified forms of human social practice, and it therefore remains a human world. Section 3. Quote, 
all science would be superfluous if the outward appearance of things and the essence of things directly coincided, end quote. Essence and appearance do not coincide directly, nor do essence and appearance belong to distinct realities. As Marx put it in an earlier work, the, quote, separation between in itself and for itself, the substance of the subject, is abstract mysticism, end quote. The essence of things is human practice in the mode of the object. Essence must appear. If it does not appear, then it is not essence. Conversely, appearance must be the appearance of essence, or appearance is nothing. There is only one reality, a reality in which society's surplus-value producers struggle to make ends meet against the background of an ever-increasing pile of material wealth, and therefore also reality of disunion, contradiction, fissures, struggles, and antagonism. The distinction between essence and appearance exists within the things themselves, in the form of irreconcilable, antagonistic, restless relations of coerced and coercive sociability, as unity of things, as negative ontology of ghost-walking economic quantities. The bourgeois relations of abstract equality, 100 pounds of this is the same as 100 pounds of that, render the difference between this and that commensurable in the form of an abstract identity, which is, quote, the actual mask of death, end quote. What appears in abstract identity is the ghost-walking reality of economic quantities, the subject's disenchantment in her own world. Distinction, the sheer quality of this and that, and the human needs that could be satisfied by either, is coerced to appear indifferent to itself in the form of value, that is, of money. In the form of money, qualitative differences vanish, and the products of labor assume the form of a certain amount of money, and this or that useful thing of definite qualities only count if they assume the opposite form of a certain quantity of money. If they fail to express themselves as such, this and that are nothing. The social validity of distinct material things appears in the form of abstract quantities of money. It does not appear in the form of satisfied human needs. In fact, products of concrete labor that cannot be transformed into money represent a socially invalid expenditure of labor and thus a loss on the investment into that labor. Exchangeability for money... Measurability through money counts. What cannot be transformed into money is burnt. It is within the concept of abstract identity, commensurability of social, quantity, social qualities in the form of a quantity of money. A 100 pounds of this for the, is the same as a 100 pounds of that in its internality and imminence that the non-coincidence of essence and appearance manifests itself. The non-coincidence strains the concept of society, forcing society, torn by contradiction and an antagonistic battle to sustain its essence, which is the, quote, life process of society, end quote, by positing C as capital, delta C as investment, and living labor as the means of valorization. On the other, on the one hand, workers might, quote, have more to lose than their chains, end quote. On the other, the, quote, poor chew their words to fill their bellies, end quote. Hegel's notion that essence has to appear does not mean that the human subject makes an appearance by asserting itself in and against the world of things, say, in terms of a conception of class struggle as a force that from the outside, breaks into the capital relation during periods of crisis and unrest. Hegel's notion that essence has to appear means that essence cannot choose not to appear. What makes essence essential subsists in appearance, however, inhospitable its world in the form of the economic object. Its appearance is thus at the same time its disappearance. The law of essence is its appearance qua disappearance. In the, quote, enchanted and perverted, end quote, world of capital, essence appears only in the form of a, quote, thing, end quote. It also appears as human suffering and as a struggle to overcome suffering. Following on from Charlotte Bauman's, 
contribution to this volume, human suffering is the non-conceptual foundation of the economic concept of society. Conceptuality holds sway in the logic of things, and that it is to, is to say, it, quote, expresses the fact that no matter how much blame may attach to the subject's contribution, the conceived world is not its own, but a world hostile to the subject, end quote. I have argued that reification arises, quote, from the social relations of production themselves, end quote. Therefore, the immediacy of the objective world is not really an immediacy of things, but the, quote, forms of appearance of essential relations, end quote. That is to say, quote, essence passes into that which lies concealed beneath the facade of immediacy of the supposed facts, and which makes the facts what they are, end quote. The circumstance that the, quote, appearance of things hides their genesis, end quote, entails a program of critique that deciphers the, quote, mysterious, end quote, forms of capitalist society as forms, quote, assumed by human relations, end quote. That is, essence appears in and subsists through mysterious forms. Negative dialectics is about the comprehension of essence in essence's appearance, that is, essence's appearance in disappearance. The force of value disappears in the law of value. It also appears in it as economic compulsion, quote, to dodge the freedom to starve, end quote, through the production of surplus value, which is the condition of wage-based on un- which is the condition of wage-based employment. The separation of labor from the means of subsistence passes into the free laborer as both trader in labor power and producer of surplus value. The free laborer is, quote, bound by invisible threads, end quote, and her, quote, economic bondage, end quote, appears as the precise opposite, as a relationship characterized by the freedom of exchange between equals before the law, each and every one endowed with the, quote, innate lights of man, end quote, pursuing their ends in liberty from each other as independent utility seekers. In this appearance, quote, the actual relations are invisible and are indeed present to the eye, the precise opposite of that relation, end quote. The abstract identity of, quote, money bags and free laborer as equal partners of contract and the civility of their exchange is as real as the same old, quote, activity of the conqueror who buys commodities from the conquered with the money he has stolen from them, end quote. I have argued that the essence of the topsy-turvy world of economic quantities is mischief. Capitalism hurts. Crisis and destruction is the ever-present nightmare of the capitalist mode of production. Excuse me. The capitalist mode of social reproduction. Quote, society finds... I'm going to blow my fucking brains out. Quote, society suddenly finds itself put back into a state of momentary barbarism. It appears as if famine... A universal war of devastation had cut off the supply of every means of subsistence. Industry and commerce seemed to be destroyed, and why? Because there is too much civilization, too much means of subsistence, too much industry, too much commerce. The productive forces at the disposal of society no longer tend to further the development of the conditions of bourgeois property. On the contrary... They have become too powerful for these conditions, by which they are fettered, and soon as and as soon as they overcome these fetters, they bring disorder into the whole bourgeois society, endanger the existence of bourgeois property. The conditions of bourgeois society are too narrow to comprise the wealth created by them. And how does bourgeois society get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces, on the other, by the conquest of new markets, and by the more thorough exploitation of the old markets. End quote. Marx. This commentary by Marx is not a brilliant anticipation, anticipation of things to come, which, after all, turned out to be far too optimistic. Rather, it conceptualizes the social object, and in doing so, shows what lies within the social object. What lies within the concept are its constituted necessities. 
creation qua destruction is a valid necessity of the capitalist social relations. Creation qua destru destruction belongs to its conceptuality. Bergiflikite. Amidst an accumulation of great wealth, capitalist reproduction, suddenly and without warning, cuts a whole class of surplus value producers off from access to the means of subsistence, making them redundant. Man vanishes in her own world and exists against herself as a personification of economic categories, a, quote, alienated subject, end quote, that in order to make a living sacrifices her living being on the altar of abstract wealth. Money is more money, to the point of madness. In sum, the, quote, domination of exchange value over human beings, which a priori prevents subjects from being subjects, degrades subjectivity itself to a mere object, and convicts the universal principle which claims to establish the predominant status of the subject as its untruth, end quote. The meaning of objectivity excludes the possibility that it can also be a subject. However, to be an object is part of the meaning of subjectivity. Subjectivity means objectification. The circumstance that objectification exists in a reified mode does not imply that there is an as yet undiscovered and indeed undiscoverable logic that lies solely within the thing itself. Only as a socially determinate object can the object be an object. Reason exists, but in rational form, in the form of a ghost-like economic object. The rational, irrational world is a rational world a mad, of maddening abstractions. Section 4. Adorno conceives of his negative dialectics as follows, quote, Negative dialectics thinks the power of the whole which is at work in every individual determination not merely as a negation of the ind that individual determination, but also as itself the negative, in other words, as the untrue, as that which thwarts reconciliation, end quote. Adorno's notion that, quote, dialectics is the consistent sense of non-identity, end quote, is about the existing untruth of things. To think dialectically is to think, quote, non-identity through identity, end quote. Definite social relations assume the form of a relationship between things and appear in their appearance as personifications of the economic categories. The identity of their social nature appears in the form of a movement of measurable abstract economic quantities, and it manifests itself in a form that does not belong to their measurable self-identity, that is, it manifests itself in the form of a daily struggle to make ends meet. This struggle belongs to the conceptuality of the economic object, but it, all, it does not belong to its identity as calculable quantity. Yet it is this struggle for the sake of social reproduction that endows the economic categories with a will. By itself, the identity of a coin is metal. What gives this metal an economic identity of overwhelming power are the social relations, a definite relation between individuals that assumes the form of a relationship between economic things, by which they governed according to the logic that holds sway in their reified identity. On the pain of ruin, money has to beget more money. Suffering is the weight of objectivity upon the subject. Therefore, to think dialectically means to think, quote, in contradictions for the sake of the contradiction once experienced in the thing and against that contradiction, end quote. Thinking dialectically means to think of man not as a metaphysical distraction to the science of economic matter, but rather as the untruth of that matter. What appears identical in the money form of wealth is non-identity under the aspect of identity. 100 pounds of this is the same as 100 pounds for that, and yet this and that are not the same. They are articles of different, quanti different qualities. Negative dialectics is, quote, suspicious of all identity, end quote, and hinges on this, quote, turn towards non-identity, end quote. That is to say, variable capital does not go on strike. Humans do. And humans go on strike at the same time 
that they really exist as personifications of variable capital. Fetishism is real, but fetishism's concept contains more than fetish the concept. Fetishism is real, but its concept contains more than it reveals. That what is non-identical to the concept drives the concept. There is no secret reality outside reification, nor is there an external vantage point from which to launch the assault. Reality is divided within itself. The resolution to the dialectical context of imminence is that context itself. Adorno's concept of the concept is emphatically practical. It holds that reification remains a form of human practice. Helmut Reichheld makes this point well when he argues that, quote, human sensuous practice subsists through its supersensible existence in the autonomization of society as both the object and subject of its perverted social practice, end quote. Adorno's, quote, concept of the concept, end quote, is distinct. According to Lukash, the worker can resist reification because as long as he rebels against it consciously, quote, his humanity and his soul are not changed into commodities, end quote. That for Lukash, the soul of the worker in resistance is the party, excuse me, according to Lukash, the worker can resist reification because as long as he rebels against it consciously, his humanity and his soul are not changed into commodities, end quote. For Lukash, the soul of the worker in resistance is the party is of no interest here. That for Lukash, the soul of the worker in resistance is the party is of no interest here. What is important, however, is that reification does not affect the soul of the worker, as if the soul is not of this world, but of divine issue. Lukash's position is a paradox. Lukash derives the revolutionary subject, he calls it the totality of the proletarian subject, represented by the party, from something that is and remains external to its reified existence. Ernst Bloch conceived of the, re, the unreified... Jesus Christ. Ernst Bloch conceived of the unreified within reification as the, quote, inner transcendence of matter, end quote. And Oscar Necht and Alexander Kluge conceived of it as, quote, materialist instinct, end quote. And Adorno, and Adorno, the very idea that there is a world out there that has not yet been colonized by the logic of things is nonsensical. Instead of a concept of society, their differentiations of society into system and soul or transcendent matter or materialist instinct separates what belongs together. Indeed, whichever formulation is favored, they all insist on a subject that is conceived in contradistinction to society. Living, leaving aside Adorno's despair, quote, he allows himself to hope only on the condition that all hope has disappeared, end quote. His conception of bourgeois society does not allow for externalities. There is only one world, and that is the world in which we live. The demand that thought is adequate to its subject matter entails more than it bargains for. Its adequacy cannot be established by means of falsification or verification. There is no verifiable, quote, it is, end quote. To say that something, quote, is, end quote, already cast doubt on the proclaimed identification of the, quote, it, end quote, and it also cast doubt on the normative idea that, quote, it, end quote, ought to be more civilized in its conduct. Like Marx's critique of political economy, Adorno's negative dialectics mocks those who depict socialism as the realization of the ideals of bourgeois society, as Marx put it. Quote, what divides these gentlemen from the bourgeois apologist is, on the one side, their sensitivity to the contradictions included in the system, 
On the other, the utopian inability to grasp the necessary difference between the real and the ideal form of bourgeois society, which is the cause of their desire to undertake the superfluous business of realizing the ideal expression again, which is in fact only the inverted projection of this reality. End quote. Or, in Adorno's succinct, succinct formulation, the quote, whole is false, end quote. Conclusion. I have argued that negative dialectics is not a formal procedure or method applied to society in the form of the economic object. Rather, it thinks out of the economic object as the, quote, very essence of the subject, end quote. It is also not a self-perpetuating triad where the thesis confronts its antithesis, reconciling the two by means of synthesis only for the synthesis to result in a new thesis. Rather, it thinks the disunited unity of the social object, its, quote, attempt to arrive at truth through the form of its own untruths, end quote, is about the understanding of the social relations in and through their, quote, apotheosized, end quote, social forms. Although the ghostly movement of reified things manifests itself behind the backs of the social individuals, it remains the social individual's world. The critique of political economy amounts fundamentally to a critical social theory. The critique of political economy rejects the perception of society as founded on economic nature as the necessary ideology of the existing social relations, instead of, quote, natural economic laws, end quote, it recognizes the social relations as the hidden secret of the economic categories. Contrary to traditional rejections of critical theory as a retreat from practice, it does not substitute thought for practice. Rather, negative dialectics amounts to a conceptualized pract praxis of the capitalist society relations and it musters thought as a preventative against a false practice. It brushes society against the grain so that the negative reason of human emancipation does not become, quote, a piece of the politics it was supposed to lead out of, end quote. On the one hand, there is the preponderance of the object, society as a real abstraction that manifests itself behind the backs of the acting social subject. And, on the other hand, there is the spontaneity of society as subject, a subject of its own object of dialectics of the forces and relations of production which might bury us all, but a subject nevertheless. Society as object does nothing. Society does not maim and kill. Quote, it is man, rather the real living man, who does all that. End quote. And in doing so bestows society as object with a deadly will. The truth contents of the quote, real life activity end quote, of reified society are the wounds that the struggles to make ends meet leave behind. These struggles may lead to new forms of repression in reified society, or they may resist the logic of reification, breaking its facade to allow a glimpse of what might be. The prospect of emancipation lies in these, quote, breaks, end quote, in its logic and in the gaps in the systematic unity of reified society. These, quote, cracks, end quote, as Holloway refers to these breaks in reification, disclose, quote, traces, end quote, of utopia already experienced in the present. Only in these, quote, traces, end quote, is there, quote, hope of ever coming across genuine and just reality, end quote. Those who demand human emancipation and for the sake of a better politics in reified society simultaneously battle against the concrete utopia of the society of human purposes contradict themselves.